Uh, today we're going to be in chapter nine. And uh, I, I didn't think ahead of time when I made the PowerPoint, but um, if I would have, I would have put maybe a picture, not, not, not like a real picture, but a picture of the Garden of Eden in there. Because I think when you go through First John and he talks about life, that's kind of the idea he wants to get us back to. I think that's kind of the idea through the Hebrew book. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve had fellowship with God. Too often we read it as day one, God created this, and day two, and day six, God created this, and day seven, God rested, and day eight, they took fruit from the tree and got kicked out of the garden. I don't think it was like that at all. And, and, and here's one reason. I think they spent years in the garden before sin came in. And here's one of the main reasons why I think so. What was the curse? What was one of the curses against the woman for taking the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil? I will increase your pain in childbearing. If she had never had children, how could that pain be increased? She'd never experienced it. So I, I believe that they were there for years, had children before sin came into the world. And the reason why I'm bringing that up is because it's this whole idea of, of fellowship with God. God came and walked with them. When God came after they took of the fruit, and they got scared because they were naked and they covered up and they hid with all those emotions that came in because of sin. They weren't scared that God came into the garden. They were used to that. They were scared because of what they had done and what they now realized. So what I believe they had in the garden was this relationship with God where they could walk and talk with him and have fellowship. And that's what we've been trying to get back to ever since. And so when they took that fruit and God curses the snake and then the man and the woman and kicks them out of the garden, what does God put in front of the garden to keep man from going back inside? Cherubim with a flaming sword. Okay. Hebrews chapter nine, verses one through five, we're going to get a reintroduction to the tabernacle. You're already familiar with it because we studied it with the sacrifices. But you get this idea, you got this burnt offering over here outside. There's this big outer curtain. You got the first veil right there. And technically, this is the first tabernacle. This is where the priest would go in day after day to offer up sacrifice, to take, the, to take care of the showbread, the altar, the incense, the, the lampstand. But then they had the second veil, and that's what separated the Ark of the Covenant, uh, where God resided. And only one priest could go in there on only one day a year. We're familiar with that Day of Atonement. But on these veils, on both of them, guess what was woven into them? Cherubim. What is the significance? God's mercy. God's mercy, but it's also, you don't have a relationship with God anymore. You have a barrier. You have broken fellowship. Remember, they had fellowship in the garden. They walked and they talked with God. And then God had to kick them out. And so they put the cherubim there to keep them separate. And so that cherubim is this reminder. Every time they see it, because the Israelites, they come into this part, but only the priests, the Levites, can come into here. Then only the high priest into here. So even out here, you can see those cherubim, and there's this constant reminder that we don't have fellowship with God. And so then we have to offer up these sin offerings and these burn offerings in order to have this fellowship. And so let's get into Hebrews. Now, the first covenant, this one, based upon the Levitical priesthood that we talked about two weeks ago, had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. A tabernacle was set up. And in the first room were the lampstand, the table, and the consecrated bread. And this is called the holy place. I'm going to go ahead and flip this on to the next one. Uh, and then we get into verse 3. It says, behind the second curtain was the room called the most holy place. And it had the golden altar of incense. Okay? That's significant. Because what I flipped, and, and now I flipped it around because we're, we're not Hebrews, so we don't go left to right. We go right to left. So this is the holy place. 
This is the most holy place. The Hebrew writer says in verse 3, 4, verse 4, I think. Yeah, in the most holy place, which had the golden altar of incense and the gold ark, the gold covered ark of the covenant. And he talks about what the ark contained. Why is the altar of incense inside the most holy place? Because it's not supposed to be. It's always out here. But what he's doing is he's showing you the day he's talking about as he goes through Hebrews chapter 9 is the day of atonement. When the high priest went in and he took incense with him to cover the, the mercy seat where God resided so they wouldn't see God and die. Remember when we studied that? <clears throat> Just say yes. Be, or else we'll do Leviticus again next month. Um, <laughs> and so he talks about the things that are in the ark. And then notice he brings it up again in verse 5. Above the ark were the cherubim of the glory. And I like the way it says the glory because it's talking about God. It's talking about where God resides. There's the cherubim of the glory overshadowing the atonement cover. But we cannot discuss these things in detail now. So he's talking about this day of atonement. <coughs> and he, he references, he talks about the second veil. There's also the first veil because if there's going to be a second, there has to be a first. So this veil with the cherubim, just like in the Garden of Eden, with the cherubim blocking the way to every Israelite that knows their history, which would be every Israelite, recognizes that cherubim means separation from God. That veil means separation from God. They can't go into worship. Only the priest can. They can't go into the Holy of Holies. Not even the priest can go in there, but only the, the high priest. And so, and this is one, here, here's a side note, but it's just fun to bring it out. There have been people who want to talk about, so, okay, let me back up. Notice verse one again. There, the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. We talked about that as we went through Leviticus. And we were familiar with the Ten Commandments and the 613 laws that Moses gave. There's regulations, there's earthly sanctuary. There are people that want to say we should use instruments in worship. And one of the reasonings is, is because David did. Matter of fact, it's commanded in the Old Testament, right? Even the Hebrew writer makes the point, you're not under the Old Testament. You can't go to the Old Testament and use it as an argument for how to worship in a new covenant. Are we commanded to sing and make music in our hearts in the new covenant? Absolutely. Was David commanded to use a harp or a lyre? Yes. You can't mix the two. But that's just, that's a side note. Let's get back to Hebrews. What we're talking about here, so we're getting into this day of atonement. So he says in verse 6. Mike? Yes. I, I kind of missed your... Okay. I got to thinking about something else when you were talking. Okay. <laughs> you were, I do that too sometimes when I'm talking. <laughs> yeah. You, you made the point there about taking the incense in. What, what was the connection here and how did... Well, so, so the connection is, and he, because it's funny, or not funny, it's interesting. When you study in Leviticus chapter 16 about the Day of Atonement, anytime the ark is set up, or the tabernacle, let's see if we can go back to that last picture. Or let's just, yeah, that one. The altar of incense is always in the holy place. And so every day the priest had to go in and offer up incense. But in Leviticus chapter 16, Aaron is the only priest working. Remember, he dresses, he, he dresses down from his robes of glory and honor, and he becomes like a regular priest. And it says that he goes in there, but he has to go in with incense. The Hebrew writer lets us know in verse 4 that presumably, maybe what he did was he brought that whole altar of incense into the Holy of Holies. Because when you read Hebrews chapter 9, verse 4, and he says inside the Holy of Holies was the altar of incense, if you know your history, and if you know the setup of the tabernacle, you're saying that's not right. The altar of incense is not in the holy place. But the Hebrew writer putting it inside the Holy of Holies is what lets us know that the day he's talking about is the day of atonement. Because that's the only time incense was brought into the Holy of Holies. And we're going to see why 
the Hebrew writer is focusing on this day as we go through chapter 9. Because then we get to verse 6, and he says, when it was set up this way, he said, when everything had been arranged like this, now the priest entered regularly into the outer room to carry on the ministry. It was 364 days a year. The priests were going into the holy place to light the candles. The candles had to be kept lit 24-7. So they're going in every day. That, that bread, the table of consecrated bread, they had to change that out every day. The incense, they burned incense every day, and it had specific purposes behind it for it's symbolic of prayer. We know that from Revelation and some other passages. But it's, it's their honor for God, this, this pleasing aroma, even through the incense. Uh, matter of fact, that's that's part of, remember last week in, in, in Hebrews chapter 8, when the Hebrew writer talks about how the priest had to offer up gifts and sacrifices. So the sacrifices were atonement sacrifices, sin offering, guilt offering half of the burnt offering, but the gifts, what were they? They're the burnt offering, the fellowship offering, uh, the free will offerings, things like that. First fruits. And so Jesus also had to offer up gifts and sacrifices. We think about Jesus offering up sacrifices because he, he was our sacrifice on the cross. What gifts did Jesus offer? Our salvation, but what is he giving to God? He's giving something to God so, yes, there's satisfaction through the sin offering. That's that sacrifice. What are the gifts? It is us. It is our worship. Uh, just jump for a second over, even into chapter 12. Uh, go to chapter 12 so you can find 13. 13 is right after 12. <laughs> chapter 13, verse 15. It, okay, if you were in nine, it shouldn't take you that long to get there. Hebrews 13, chapter, chapter 13, verse 15. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer up to God the sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips, and confess his name. How, so when we sang songs this morning, you know what that is? That's the fruit of lips, confess his name. And how does God take that? How, do you think sometimes that when we sing our songs or when we offer up our prayers, I've heard some pretty awful ones sometimes. And I've heard some singing that was pretty pathetic. Not here. Or at least today. But that that becomes glory and worship to God. How? How does God, uh, an almighty God, creator of the universe, how is he glorified through our feeble offerings that we offer him? Through Jesus. Because we offer it through Jesus. Jesus takes it and purifies it and gives gifts to God. What is his gifts? Our worship. So he's offering gifts. And so that's the idea here. They went in to do those gifts to carry on their ministry in this outer room, but only the high priest, verse 7. Which means we got to go to the next slide. Only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins that people had committed in ignorance. And so, going back to think of that tabernacle picture, that's just it. There's two tabernacles. There's that first one where 364 days a year, the priests go in, offer up gifts and sacrifices to God, and it's worship. And then there's that second tabernacle behind that second veil, and that's where verse 7 says, but only the high priest went in, and that only once a year, and never without blood. Because remember when he took the incense in there, he also took blood and he sprinkled it, before the Ark of the Covenant, he sprinkled it uh, by the veil because you have to consecrate things with blood. Uh, we're going to see that as we keep going through here. Now the first covenant I recognize Amen. for worship. Also. Uh, that's chapter 9, verse 1. But notice, here's what's interesting. He's leading us all up to this. Reminding us of that first tabernacle, of that the way the priests work. Now it's set up for the Day of Atonement. Uh, only the high priest can go in there, but never without blood. Notice verse 8. The Holy Spirit was showing. That's a key word, showing. The Holy Spirit has a plan with all of this. That the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still standing. As long as there's still that holy place. 
what Israelite could get to the most holy place? Only one of them out of a minimum of two million people and only one day a year. And the Hebrew writer says the whole purpose of that, yes, the whole reason why God had Moses pen the book of Leviticus was an illustration. The whole reason why they had to go through these sacrifices and these rituals was all an illustration. The Holy Spirit was showing to the Israelites that fellowship that Adam and Eve had in the garden. You don't have it. And as long as that first tabernacle, that holy place still stands, nobody's getting close to God except for the high priest one day a year. That's not enough. But again, there's reason behind. That's one of the things I want us to learn from this. And that's why we went through the sacrifices. We need to see how scripture is connected. And the Hebrew writer is going to tell us time and time again. Matter of fact, it's going to come up again here in chapter 9. About how everything in that Old Testament is a shadow of the realities we have in Jesus. It's important to remember that. There's nothing insignificant in the Old Testament that doesn't have some type of relevance in the new. And so it says the Holy Spirit was showing by this verse 8 that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still standing. And then he even goes on to say what I was just telling you he was going to say. Verse 9, this is an illustration for the present time. This is an illustration for you. Who's the you? I know, I know the new you's not in there, but that's who he's writing to. Is he writing it to you? No. He's writing this to first century Hebrew Christians. It's been preserved for us, but it's not to us. So these first century Hebrew Christians are familiar with the Old Testament system, with the Old Covenant, with the sacrifices, with the tabernacle, with the holy place, with the holy of holies, and how they can't get to God. As long as that first tabernacle is still standing. It's an illustration for the present time for you Hebrew Christians to understand that the gifts and the sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. Why could the sacrifices offered under the Old Testament not clear the conscience of the worshiper? Christ had made atonement. And whenever they offered up a sacrifice, what did they have to do the next time they sinned? Yeah. Offer up another sacrifice. And then, I think I got two slides on this section, so let's see if I do. Yep. Um, and then on top of that, they have the Day of Atonement. What's the purpose of the Day of Atonement? <laughs> a national, annual reminder You've sinned. You need atonement. And so even if you've offered up your own sin offering, you still have to go through this process of fasting and afflicting yourself one day a year to remember all your sins. The old covenant system did not allow for the worshiper to have a clear conscience. Now, just like David brought up last week in chapter 8, was that a problem with the law? Was that a problem with the old covenant? No. No, it's a problem with the people. You don't have to worry about your conscience if you just do what is right, right? Just don't sin. And then you'll have a clear conscience. The problem isn't the law. The problem is the people who break the law. And so then we have this illustration for this present time that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They're only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings. External regulations applying to the time of the new order. I'm reading from the NIV. Notice he says they're only a matter of food and drink. Remember the, the drink offering, the fellowship. You, you know, you bring your food, you bring your drink. Sometimes you get to around and have a feast with God. Sometimes it's just for the priest to get to eat something for God. Matter of fact, somebody asked a question last week um, about what the high priest benefited from for being the high priest. Uh, 
he was the one who got the wave breast. No. Yeah, the wave breast and then the heat side. Okay, so the wave breast, so the high priest and his family always got the breast. But then the thigh, the right thigh, was heaved before the Lord and given to the priest who was officiating. So yes, not only did the high priest and the priest make money, that sounds bad, they got paid for working the temple through the tithes that the Israelites would give, but then they also got the food from the sacrifices, and the high priest got a, a portion of just about every sacrifice. So there was benefit to being the high priest. I don't see how in the world they can eat all that. <laughs> <laughs> I had two million kids. Um, but that's a good question. I mean, so it's only a matter of food and drink, various ceremonial washings. We talked about that the other day uh, when we were in chapter six, talking about the ABCs of the Old Testament uh, system. And he talks about instructions about baptisms. It's really more about washings. It's like Jesus getting in trouble for not washing his hands before he ate. It wasn't because he didn't go and use soap and water to wash his hands. They, he didn't go through this ceremonial cleansing. Uh, even Dell mentioned it again last week in a small group I'm in with him. Uh, him and Kim were talking about when they went to Jerusalem. There, there are baptismal places all over Jerusalem. Baptism was not an uncommon thing because it was some type of ceremonial washing that you would do. If you were a Gentile and wanted to proselyte to Judaism, you would get baptized. And so that's what he's talking about here with these ceremonial washings. There were things they did. Matter of fact, if you went back and looked at that, tip, that picture of the tabernacle, that first one, between the altar of burnt incense and the actual tabernacle, there was this big basin of water. For what? Washing. And it's all symbolic. They had to do that every time they went into the tabernacle. What if they hadn't done a sacrifice? What if they just had to bring a fork in or bring some incense in or something? You still went through this ceremonial act of washing. And that's what he's talking about here. And he says, this is all, these are external regulations. And I tell you that that is the biggest difference between the old covenant and the new covenant. Is God is tired of the external. People can go through the motions. Honestly, that's why I think we don't use instruments. That's why we don't use sacrifices. Because in the Old Testament, they did. And what happened often? They learned to go through the motions. Sometimes we do that when we take the Lord's Supper. And that's sad. We, we shouldn't. But I understand. Sometimes you're just not thinking and you're, you just, it just becomes routine because we're so used to doing it. But you got to remember what that represents. External regulations applying until the time of the new order. A better translation <clears throat> for that in verse 10 would say something to the effect of until the time of the Reformation. Something has to be reformed because something has been deformed. What has been deformed? Our relationship with God. What happened in the Garden of Eden? We did what he gave 872 trees. I don't know. I just made that up. <laughs> Even if there was only 10 trees, there was only one they were told not to eat from. You know what that means? They could eat from every single other one. They probably weren't even hungry when they got tempted by the snake and deceived and saw, hey, that's good for food, pleasing to die, and I could be smart like God and took an eight. Uh, so our relationship, the guy, man got kicked out of the garden. We no longer had that walking and talking with God relationship. That's been deformed, our relationship. It has to be reformed. And guess what's going to happen through Jesus? It gets reformed. Reconciliation. Just like Dale said, we're in the, last, we're in the end times. Uh, spoiler alert, if you haven't gone to worship yet. Uh, this is the time of the new order. And so now when Christ came as high priest, in verse 11, when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made, and that is to say not a part of this creation. And I, I'm going to share something with you just so you can kind of have it in your mind. It's not important to really know this, but in the Greek they use 
two letters, not two letters, but two words sometimes for arguments. It's called men and they. Men stands for, on the one hand, this. They is, but on the other hand, this. This is actually in the Hebrew structure, or in the Greek structure, in Hebrews chapter 9. In verse 1, it has the men. Now, when the tabernacle was set up like this, it had this regulations and this earthly tabernacle. The day, the but, comes in verse 11. So if you have a translation that has but as the first word in verse 11, that's a good translation. I had to write my name with a pen. Because he's making this contrast. Here's the old covenant. But when Christ came, we got something different. He came as a high priest of the good things that are already here. And he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made. That is to say, not a part of this creation. He didn't go through a man-made tabernacle that, like Moses made for the people. And where was God's presence in that tabernacle? In the Holy of Holies. And only one day a year could one man go in there, the high priest. Okay, But what did Jesus do? He went through a more perfect tabernacle. Guess which tabernacle that is? If the tabernacle represents the presence of God, Jesus went straight into heaven, right in front of God's throne. You can't get any closer than that. He didn't have a Zoom meeting with God. He showed up in person, right in front of him. And he did not enter, verse 12, by means of the blood of goats, of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. How did he do this? Through his own blood. He enters into the most holy place, into the presence of God by his own blood, one time for all time, having offered up that, that sacrifice. I can't remember. Yeah, I have it up here. Which do you prefer? A dumb animal that has no clue why it's dying to be your substitute for sin? Or someone who willingly, understanding the full implications of death and what they're doing it for, for you, take your place? That's part of the reason why this new covenant is more perfect than the old. We're not relying on dumb animals to take care of this. We're relying on the Son of God. Now notice 13 through 15 is really important. And really it's 14 and 15, but 13 throws the animals in there. So that's, I'll do verse 13 first, and we'll talk about that for a second. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean, sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. We never did get to have time to talk about the ashes of a heifer. But that's another sacrifice from the Old Covenant. It's out of Numbers chapter 19. So what they would do, is you, you had to have a red heifer. And then you would sacrifice it, you burn it up, you take its ashes, you mix it with water, and you get some uh, scarlet hyssop and wool and stuff, and then you can sprinkle lepers with it. You can sprinkle somebody who was unclean because they touched a dead body. Anybody that was unclean. Now, when we say unclean, we, it doesn't imply sinful. It just means they are unpure to worship God because of touching a dead body or, you know, a woman one week a month, uh, the leprosy getting, getting cured from a disease. All these things would make you unclean. And so the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on them would make you clean so that you are sanctified, holy to go worship again. So that's what, in verse 13, we're familiar with the, the blood of the bulls and goats because we talked about that. But the ashes of a heifer, we never talked about that. That's what that one's referring to, Numbers 19. They're ceremonially unclean, and it sanctifies them so that they are outwardly clean. That red heifer sacrifice, that sin offering, we already saw back up, I think, around, around verse 9 or 10. Uh, what can that do for your conscience? Nothing. That red heifer sacrifice, when you get sprinkled with that, it sanctifies you outwardly. 
What does it do for your heart? What does it do for your mind? Absolutely nothing. Now, that's when we get into 14 and 15. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? If the blood of bulls and goats could cleanse you outwardly only and not even cleanse your conscience, how much more will the blood of Christ Notice all these words that it says. Who through the eternal spirit he offered. He's the priest. He offered himself. Himself, he's the sacrifice. Unblemished. There is no stain. There was no sin. If Jesus had one single sin in his 33 and a half years of life, he could not be our sacrifice. He has to be unblemished. There's a reason why in the Old Testament, when you were bringing a sacrifice to God, God said, don't bring me your lame. Don't bring me your blind. Don't bring me, bring me your maimed. You bring me your unblemished, your perfect animals. One principle we get from that is we give God our best. But the main principle he wanted us to learn for that, from that is because he's going to give us his best. Because Jesus is unblemished. Offered himself unblemished to God, the one who needs the satisfaction. And what does it do? Cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. What are acts that lead to death? Sin. You know, in, in, in Genesis chapter 3, when Satan came in and asked the woman, did God really say she can't eat from any tree in this garden? No, no, he didn't say that. Just this one tree we can't eat from, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You know why God said that? Because you'll be like him. And it was desirable. Uh, but that act of taking that fruit. Okay, I got lost there for a second. Why did Satan tell the woman? God said, Satan said, you know why God said that? Because you'll be like him. But you know what else he said when he said that to her? And Adam, because Adam was right there with him. You won't surely die. And what happened when they took that fruit? They surely died, but they didn't. They started. They were still walking around, living, breathing. Maybe Spiritually. Satan was right. Spiritually dying. Exactly. And that's the whole point here. It's a spiritual death. You don't want the spiritual death. That's the second death talked about in Revelation 21, verse 8. But notice what he says just before that. Cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death. It can cleanse our conscience. That's what Jesus' blood can do. We studied two years ago in 1 John, in chapter 1, and verse 7, if you walk in the light as he is in the light, you have fellowship with the Father. You can have fellowship with 100% perfect God because the blood of his son Jesus purifies you from all your sin you're not perfect and you're not sinless as you have your fellowship with God but it's because of the blood of Jesus that constantly purifies us Jesus is still working today just as much as he did 2,000 years ago he doesn't have to give himself over as a sacrifice anymore he did that one time for all time and then sat down but he's still working at keeping us holy. You know why? We still sin. But if you'll walk in the light, as God is in the light, then the blood of Jesus will continually purify you from those sins so that you can have relationship. And you know what that gives you? A clean conscience. Even though you know what you did. And it's hard for you to forget what you did. But if you'll trust in the Father, this is why, to me, it's so important that we don't walk around mopey as Christians. We need to walk around proud. Not because of us, but because of what God has done for us. And so in 1 Peter 3, verse 21, Peter is talking about the ark. 
uh, not the Ark of the Covenant, but the Ark that Noah built on the water. And eight people were saved in all by that flood. And he says in verse 21, in 1 Peter chapter 3, this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you. It's not to play, uh, not the not the removal of dirt from the body, but it's a pledge of a good conscience towards God. A good, clean conscience. That's what we get through Jesus. That sort of makes us the childlike that God said that Jesus said we accept forgiveness. Exactly. Because if you if you can really accept forgiveness, then we are purified. We have that childlike spirit. How many how many times your child do something wrong? They've asked for something or whatever it is, and they get in trouble. And then two minutes later, they're asking for something else again. They've already moved on. How many times we let ourselves wallow in shame, which is a consequence of sin? And that's not what God wants for us. It's not who he made us to be. And so we get this clean conscience uh, so that we can serve. This is why you get it. Not just so that you can walk around proud, hey, I have no sin, because you're a liar, if you think that way. But you get a clear conscience so that you can serve the living God. If you're all the time thinking about how sinful you are, and how awful you are, and how no good you are, why are you going to tell your neighbor about Christ? You're not going to serve God, because you're too busy focused on yourself and your own sin, and not trusting him that he gave you forgiveness of it. But when you accept that, and trusting, you can serve him. Uh, verse 15. So for this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant. That those who are called. Now, stop thinking like a 20th century Christian. Those who are called is a reference to Old Testament saints. Not you. In verse 15. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant. A new law. So that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Now that he has died as a ransom to set them, who's the them? Old Testament saints, free from the sins committed under the first covenant. Christ is that mediator who, through his ransom, sets them free in the old covenant, as well as us in the new. Uh, and I just looked at the clock, and we're going too slow. Uh, verse 16 down for Lebes, you want to talk about this will. In the case of a will, and understand, the word, the Greek word for will is the exact same Greek word for covenant. A will is a covenant. There are some covenants that are just one-sided. Very few. But one example, Deuteronomy chapter 5, 10 commandments. In chapter 5, verse 2 of Deuteronomy, Moses says, God has made this covenant with you. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me, no graven images. Don't take my name in vain. Honor the Sabbath. Honor your mother, mother and father. And don't kill, lie, steal, adultery, and all that stuff. That's a one-sided covenant. Most covenants are two-sided. You have to live up to your end of the bargain, the, the bargain, the agreement. And that's what he's getting ready to get into here. In the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it. Because a will is in force only when somebody has died. It never takes effect while the one who made it is living. Why? Because they can still change it. Okay. I have two daughters. If I make a will for my two daughters that when I die, they get all my worldly possessions. Right? It's all, but as, as long as I'm still alive, I can change that and say, well, I'd rather give that to, to Randall. He'll use it better. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's funny. I wouldn't do that either. Um, <laughs> verse 18. This is why even the first covenant was not put into effect without blood. Moses consecrated everything with blood. And then when Moses had proclaimed every commandment of the law to all the people, he took the blood of the calves, together with water, scarlet wool, the branches of hyssop, sprinkled the scroll on all the people. And he said, this is the blood of the covenant, which God has commanded you to keep. So notice what Jesus did when he took the, the last supper and he took the fruit of the vine. What did he say? This is my blood. Of the new covenant. Had that phrase ever been uttered before? Yes, it just didn't have the word new in it. Moses said, this is the blood of the covenant. Jesus said, this blood of the new covenant is my blood. And one other thing about that will that I forgot to mention because we're moving on. After that will takes place, 
I die and I tell my daughters in my will that they can inherit all my possessions, but I put conditions on it. They have to attend Greenlawn Church of Christ in order to inherit all my blessings, all my possessions. And let's say Sonia, she still lives in Lubbock. So she's like, yeah, I can do that. But my other daughter, Katrina, she lives in Houston. And that, she's like, I'm not leaving Houston for that. Does she get any part of my will? No, because it's conditional. I willed for her to have half my possessions. But if she chooses not to live up to her end of the bargain, that will is null and void. Okay, here's the best way to illustrate this. Does God want all men to be saved? First yes. Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. Yes, he does. Second Peter 3, 9. God wants all men to come to repentance. That's why God's patient with us. Okay, are all men going to, did Jesus die for sins of the whole world? Yes. Is the whole world going to be saved? God wants all men to be saved. Why aren't all the people going to be saved? Because if they don't accept, it's that will, it's that covenant. Just like if Katrina decides not to move from Houston, go to Greenlawn, if that's my condition, his condition is you have to accept, you have to obey, you have to trust. And if they choose not to, doesn't mean he didn't die for their sins, he did. They're just choosing not to accept. And so then there's this new covenant in blood. So let's get down to verse 21, 22. In the same way he, Jesus, sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and everything used in its ceremonies. And in fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. For without the shedding of blood, there is no <coughs> forgiveness. You have to have Jesus's blood. Oh, we didn't move on. Sorry. There's probably a PowerPoint for that. Um, verse 23. It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices. What are the copies of the heavenly things? That's the tabernacle. That was the people. That's what he was just talking about earlier with Moses sprinkling. They had to be, uh, what's the word he used? Purified with these sacrifices, with that blood. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices. So the Old Testament things, he calls copies. The New Testament, it's better sacrifices. Did you notice that? He said sacrifices, not just sacrifice. How many times did Jesus die on the cross? One time for all time. And that's the sacrifice we always think about. But you know what he did? He emptied himself of being God and was born here, flesh and blood as a man. Lived in this world for 33 and a half years and never sinning. That is sacrifice too. Jesus' entire life was a burnt offering to, to God. How many times did he give in to sin? That's a sacrifice. He's denying self in order to honor God. He gives himself as a grain offering, a fellowship offering. Every one of the sacrifices in the Old Covenant, Jesus fulfills in his life. His entire life was a sacrifice culminating in the ultimate sacrifice of death on the cross. That's why the Hebrew writer says it's better sacrifices that Jesus gave to consecrate these things for Christ, verse 24, did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself. That's what we talked about a minute ago. Now to appear for us in God's presence. Christ entered heaven itself, not a copy of the sanctuary, but heaven, right where God is. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again the way the high priest enters the most holy place, the day of atonement, every year with blood that is not his own, then Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But now he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. There are three appearings in the book of Hebrews right here. We just saw two of them. Notice verse 26. In the middle of that, it says, he has now appeared once for all, to be that sacrifice, he has appeared. He now appears, that's verse 24, backing up a couple verses. He now appears for us in God's presence, doing what? Jack, remember all those things you did yesterday that was wrong? Oh, wait a minute. 
got Jesus on here instead. So let's, let's look up Gary. Oh, no, nope, that says Jesus too. He is constantly, even today, now to appear before God to purify you of your sin. The third appearing comes down in verse 28. So let's get to verse 27, 28. Just as man is destined to die once and after that's face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people, and he will appear. So he has appeared, he now appears, and he will appear again a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. That's Revelation 19. When you see the rider on the white horse and his robe is dipped in blood and the armies of heaven, that's us, are following him riding on white horses, dressed in fine linen, white and clean, that blood is not his blood from the cross. That's the blood of our enemies, of him fighting our battles for us. That's why our robes are white and clean, because he does all the work. We follow, we trust, we obey, we submit to the rider on the white horse. But that blood is not his own. He did that one time for all time. When he comes again, it's going to be to bring salvation. But notice verse 27, too, for a second, since we got a minute. Maybe. Uh, just as man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment. I want to spend a minute just telling you what judgment is going to be like if you're in Christ. Because we're familiar with 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, where Paul says, everyone must be uh, appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of all the things in your life done, whether good or bad. But then later in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, he says, Jesus became sin for us, became our sin offering for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So it's exactly what I was just saying. When you go stand before God in judgment, and he pulls out his book, and he looks up your name, you know what he sees? Jesus. Do you know what happens immediately when you go to judgment? You don't. Enter in. Well done, good and faithful servant. John chapter 5, verse 24. I've got it over here already. Really. Jesus says it himself in John 5, verse 24. He says, very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but is crossed over from death to life. Are we all going to go to judgment? Yes. Are we all going to be judged? No. We have crossed over from death to life. Why? Because of Jesus Christ. That's why he says in verse 14, how much more than will the blood of Christ who went straight into the very throne room of God and said, I've taken care of it by his own blood. You remember the story, Matthew and Luke, uh, no, Matthew and Mark both tell us about that veil being ripped in two from top to bottom. That shows the Israelites that the way to God is open. That fellowship, we talked about this in 1 John with life. We get to have that same fellowship that Adam and Eve had in the garden. Walking, talking with God. Not having to be ashamed because of what Jesus did. And there was that discussion about, did a high priest come in and sew up that curtain? You know they did. They went in the next day and saw that curtain ripped in two from top to bottom. You know they had to sew it back up because that had to freak them out when they saw the Ark of the Covenant. Because what did they think would happen if they saw the Ark of the Covenant? They're supposed to die. Did they die? No, you know why? God's presence isn't there. The old covenant, remember what David taught you guys last week, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13. When Jeremiah said this covenant is a new covenant coming, he made that old covenant old and obsolete and will disappear. It disappears in reality, spiritually, when Jesus goes to the cross. Physically, they're still messing around with it, but AD 70 is right around the corner. And when AD 70 hits, it is no more. That's how good Jesus is. We don't fully understand, I think, at times how good we have it being New Testament Christians. We get to have a relationship with God that Israelites never got to enjoy. And we're going to see that when we get to Hebrews chapter 11. But first, next week, the next two weeks, we have to get through chapter 10. Y'all have a blessed day.